How's everyone doing this morning? Bless. Amen. Welcome to Life in Christ Ministry. We are glad that you are here this morning. We welcome you. For you that are listening through our broadcast, we welcome you as well. We just want to go ahead and uh, read the Bible this morning. If you can open your Bible to Psalms 150. Psalm 150 says, let, sorry, my phone is acting up, let all things praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise God in his sanctuary, praise him in his mighty firmament, praise him for his mighty acts, praise him according to his excellent greatness, praise him with the sound of the trumpet, praise him with the lute and harp. Praise him with the tremble and dance. Praise him with stringed instruments and flutes. Praise him with loud cymbals. Praise him with clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. It's just an amaz uh, amazing. It's just wonderful how God is to us, amen. He has brought us here together to worship Him. And if you agree with me in reading this word, take a stand to walk with God today, this morning. Take a stand to praise Him, to worship Him, amen. It's just a joy to be here um, just with one another. Let us close our eyes and we'll thank Him for everything He has done, amen, to open up service. Father God, we thank you, Lord. For you are good to us, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus, because you have brought us here together to praise you and to worship you, Lord. We ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit take over our hearts, over our minds, Father. Take over this service, Father. In Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord, for what you are going to do among us, Father. In Jesus' name, we thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Woo, we serve a good God. And to this morning, I just want us to be on our feet as we give thanks to Him in song. Amen? Yes. Are you excited to be in the house yes. of the Lord? Yes. Woo. Our God is so good. Amen. Yes, let's put our hands together for the Lord. We give thanks to you, Lord. We bless your name. We sing praise to you. There's no one like you, Jesus. Sing it with me. Give thanks to the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. For he is good, he is above all things. His love endures forever. Sing. stretched arm his love endures forever for the life that's been reborn his love endures forever sing praise sing praise sing praise sing praise sing praise sing praise His love endures forever, and by the grace of God we will carry on. His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise, hallelujah. Sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, sing praise.
His love unto us forever. His love, His love unto us forever. His love. forever the bible declares in romans that there is nothing everybody say nothing, nothing. there is nothing, nothing that can put a wedge between god and his love for you amen his love endures forever forever god you are faithful to us forever god you are strong there is nothing impossible this morning so we declare that god our love is coming back to you our faith is coming back to you God we worship you yes. Jesus his love endures forever let's sing it one more time his love his love endures forever his love to know that God is here would you turn your attention with me to the book of first Samuel we're going to look at three chapters of scripture today four six four five and six first Samuel four five and six just in the just a few first verses of chapter seven today we're going to talk about the ark of the covenant we're going to talk about the ark of the covenant as you make your way to that passage of scripture um in just a few minutes, we'll also have a water baptism, so we invite you uh, to linger. After, uh, after we close here, we're going to step outside together and celebrate water baptism. That's always exciting. We remind you of prayer meeting throughout uh, the week. And uh, beginning tomorrow, we're going we're gonna to have different intercessors leading Monday night prayer meeting. And I'm really excited about that. This will give us an opportunity to... Um, to have different leaders leading, and that's always exciting. Um, I also want to m emphasize Wednesday night, because we're going to have communion and fellowship. Bring some refreshments so afterwards we can all share and spend some time together. Uh, we spend so much time, it seems, in the Bay Area, especially running around, and there's always, we always have a place to go and people to see and things to do. Uh, so on that Wednesday, we'll, we'll take some time to just fellowship and, and celebrate a family. Um, 
there will be uh, communion as well and, and worship, so we're looking forward to that. Uh, today we're delighted to welcome with us um, Sister Rahila's parents. They are pastors, and uh, they pastor in Southern California, and it's, it's a joy to have them visiting with us, uh, Brother Andrew's uh, in-laws. And they're here today. Uh, pastors, would you please stand and greet the church where you are, and we'd welcome you. We're delighted that you're here, and uh, God bless you. Thanks for uh, joining us for service today. All right, let's uh, look at uh, 1 Samuel chapter 4. I wanna, uh, we're going to be talking about the Ark of the Covenant. And just, just as a reference, the Ark of the Covenant was a box about the size of this pulpit. And it was made of wood covered with gold. This box had a, a, a lid that was made of solid gold. And it was called the mercy seat. On top of, the, of this lid, there were two angels also made of solid gold. And uh, they, they were, they were sh uh, cherubim, to be more specific. And the cherubim are, uh, they, they have uh, six wings. And with two, they cover themselves, with four, they cover themselves. With two, they, they, they had their wings stretched forward and they were facing each other so that the tip of their wings touched and um, in the in between them the glory of God would manifest in a glow when the priest w would come and minister in the holy of holies God would manifest his presence now the Bible tells us that God is a spirit so when this happened um, there would be a, a, a physical, a material manifestation that God was present. And so uh, the Ark of the Covenant was very holy. It was the holiest object in the tabernacle. And it was sectioned off from everything else by curtains. And nobody had access to that place. It was called the Holy of Holies. And only the high priest, only the high priest would go there. And usually only once a year. There was a specific family from Israel that was designated to carry the, the Ark of the Covenant. So not anybody could carry it. And there was a specific way in which it was supposed to be carried. Uh, there were loops on both sides of the box. And there was a golden rod that went through those loops. And a specific family from the Levites would pick up those rods and, and put them on, on their shoulders, four of them, one on each corner, and they would carry the Ark of the Covenant. Inside the Ark of the Covenant, there were three objects. The tablets of the, uh, the Ten Commandments, which are the only part of the Bible that were actually written by the hand of God. So they were very special and very holy. The two tablets were inside. Next to the two tablets, there was also a basket of manna, because while they were in the desert, God told Moses, take a basket of manna, put it in the Ark of the Covenant, so that forever there will be a, a, a reminder to the people of my provision in the wilderness. Also, in the, inside this box, there was a rod, the rod of Aaron. Aaron, you'll recall, is Moses' older brother. And while they were uh, wandering in the wilderness... His authority was challenged at one point. And, uh, and God said, well, let's settle the matter this way. God speaking through Moses said, let's settle this, the matter this way. All the supposed leaders, all the people who want to be leader in the place of Aaron, bring your rod uh, to you, uh, with you to the tabernacle tomorrow morning. And uh, Aaron will bring his as well. Now remember, a rod is a dead old stick. So they all bring their dead old stick and, and Moses says, okay, let's put him in the, in the tabernacle and the one that buds, when we come back tomorrow, the one that is budding with, 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 uh, with leaves and so on, it's, it comes back to life, is the sign that that's the one that God has chosen to, to be a leader. And, uh, and Aaron's rod was the only one that budded. So God said, as a reminder of this, Take that rod and put it inside the Ark of the Covenant. So those are the three items that were inside of the, the Ark of the Covenant. You might imagine it was quite, the, the, I, I would imagine that the, the Ark was quite heavy. Again, it's made of wood and covered with gold. It has, it has this lid of gold with two angels of solid gold. So it was a heavy object. 
It was probably quite beautiful as well. It was architectured by God himself. And then on top of it, inside the box are these three items. So it's, it's, a, it's a heavy box. It's, it's an impressive box. But more importantly, it's a holy box. It is a holy box. God has chosen that box to be a symbol of his presence and to be a place where his glory will shine and from where he will manifest himself. All right, so um, that's what we mean when we talk about the Ark of the Covenant. Now, we already mentioned the Ark of the Covenant last week in passing, but today I just want to talk about it because there's some important things uh, for us to learn in the next few chapters that have to do with the Ark of the Covenant. You'll recall from last week that uh, the, the people of Israel in their backsliding ways, went to battle with the Philistines, which was a neighboring, uh, a neighboring country. And when, they, uh, when things didn't go well, they decided to bring the Ark of the Covenant to the battlefield, hoping that that would turn things around. So that's where we pick up the story. 1 Samuel chapter 4, verse 2. Then the Philistines put themselves in a battle array against Israel. And when they joined battle... Israel was defeated by the Philistines who killed about 400 men of the army in the field. They went to battle and they lost, the, they went to war and they lost the first battle. Verse 3, and when the people had come into the camp, the elders of Israel said, why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? Pause there for a second. And, and, and let's think this through with me. They are surprised that they, they lost the battle. Why are they surprised? Because they're not supposed to lose. They remember, it hasn't been written yet, but they knew in all things we're supposed to be more than overcomers through Jesus Christ our Lord. They remember that God had promised Israel victory, especially when they were attacked, not the attackers. And this is the Philistines invading their promised land. So they have every right to expect victory. And yet they, they encounter defeat. So they're surprised and say, why would the Lord do this? Well, we, we studied the book of Judges already. And we know why, don't we? They had backslidden from the Lord. They had walked away from the covenant. And, more, and they were getting further and further from God. And as they got further from God, they got further from God's blessing, from God's protection, and from God's provision. But the funny thing about uh, back, backsliding is that backsliders often, generally backsliders don't see their backsliding ways. They don't realize that they're back, they have backslidden. So they looked at the situation and said, why, why, is thing, why are things going so bad? Well, verse 3, this is the, their solution. Let us bring the ark of the covenant of the Lord from Shiloh to us. That when it comes among us, it may save us from the hand of our enemies. Somebody had this great idea. Oh, why don't we bring the ark of God's glory, the ark of the covenant, the symbol of his presence, bring it to the battlefield because then we're going to win. Things are going to turn around. Verse 5. And when the ark of the covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel shouted so loudly that the earth shook. They got so excited, now we're going to win. Now we're going to show those Philistines. We've got the box, and God is in that box. We're safe now. And it was so impressive. Their screaming was so impressive. Look at verse 6. Now when the Philistines heard the noise of the shout, they said, What does the sound of this great shout in the camp of the Hebrews mean? Then they understood that the ark of the Lord had come into the camp. So the Philistines were afraid, for they said, God has come into the camp. And they said, Woe to us, for such a thing has never happened before. So far, so good, right? They brought God in the box, and they're safe. They have a shouting service. Everybody's excited. They're screaming. They're, they're shouting and dancing and jumping up and down so loud that the Philistines a mile away heard it and were impressed. And they are afraid now because they thought, wait a minute, we just defeated them yesterday. Why are they so excited? And one of the scouts came back and said, well, they brought this box and God is in the box. And now they're all excited. We're in trouble. And the Bible says they were afraid. Wow. Wow. Nothing like this has ever happened before. 
They've got God in a box, and they can just bring him out whenever they want to. And boy, we're in trouble now. They go out to battle the next day, verse uh, 8. Excuse me, verse 7. So the Philistines were afraid, for they said, God has come into the camp. Verse 8. Woe to us, who will deliver us from the hand of these mighty gods? These are the gods who struck the Egyptians with all the plagues in the wilderness. Notice something important in verse 8. Number one, gods, plural. That means they don't know Je Jehovah. Because if you know Jehovah, you know Jehovah is one. It's, it's, it's lesson number one. Theology 101, Jehovah God is one. So they say God's plural, they don't know God. Also, notice it's God with all small uh, letters, and it's not God's proper name, God's personal name. They're not referring to God, to Yahweh. They're referring to God's plural. In other words, they have this idea of uh, polytheism, that there are multiple gods. And he says, well, they've got their gods and their gods are coming out. Their gods, are they, they have no personal relationship with Yahweh. They have no, they have the concept of God, but it's an empty concept. It's an eggshell with nothing inside. And so they say, but they know the history and they remember. And this is meaningful because the crossing of the Red Sea and the plagues in Egypt happened about, happened about 400 years ago. So 400 years later, the rumblings are still going on that God is powerful and that the God of Israel answers prayer and he can open the Red Sea and he can bring fire from heaven and he can destroy a powerful nation. So they're still thinking about that and they're still afraid because of that, but they have no personal relationship with God. So again, they, they talk about God's plural. Verse 9, be strong and conduct yourselves like men. This is that war talk. You Philistines, that you do not, do not become servants of the Hebrews as they have been to you. Conduct yourselves like men and fight. Now pause here for a second. If you've never read this passage before, what do you expect to happen? Who is going to win? The Philistines are afraid. The Israelites are celebrating. The Israelites got the box with God, supposedly with God inside. Well... I don't know what your answer is, but I can tell you what the Israelites expected. They fully expected to win the next battle. And I can tell you what the Philistines expected. They fully expected to go out to the battlefield and meet these gods, these gods, and they were afraid for it. So they said, well, let's give it our best shot. We're already here. We're fighters. We're brave. We're going to fight. And if we win, we win. If we lose, we lose. Verse 10, so the Philistines fought and Israel was defeated. Wait a minute, this wasn't supposed to be. They've got the box. They need a bigger box, don't they? <laughs> uh, they? They were defeated and every man fled to his tent. And there was a very great slaughter. And there fell of, the, of Israel 30,000 foot soldiers. Now in the previous battle, they were weeping because they lost, what, 400 people? Uh, excuse me, 4,000, verse 2, 4,000 men. Now they lost 30,000. Things went from bad to very much worse. And this is where the, from this defeat, Eli's children die. And from this defeat, the Ark of the Covenant is stolen from Israel. All right. We go down to verse 21. You remember Eli's... Uh, daughter-in-law has a baby and they named the baby Ichabod. Ichabod means literally means no glory or as as they interpreted the glory has departed the glory is no more the glory is gone and I mention that because Ichabod is one of the saddest names in scripture it's one of the the low points in Israel's history and anytime you see the word Ichabod it's, it's, it's a bad sign. It's a bad thing. Kabod means glory. E, the, 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 that first letter I, uh, is, is a negative. It means it, 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 uh, it cancels whatever comes after it. So Ichabod, no glory. Glory is gone. The glory has departed. And it's always a sad thing when Ichabod is written over someone's life or over a ministry, over a church, uh, when, when, when God writes Ichabod over something or someone, it's a sad thing. 
And, and may God help us to always avoid the Ichabod state. But that's where Israel, uh, that's, that's where Israel was. They, they came to Ichabod. That was truly the state of the nation. All right. Let's go on to chapter 5. And we'll, and we'll make some comments about chapter 4 in just a moment as we close. But let's look at chapter 5. And we won't read all of the chapter. But there's some important things to highlight here. The Philistines took the Ark of the Covenant. So they think, oh wow. We've got their gods inside this box. And now the box belongs to us. So we've got their gods. We've just been fortified. Boy, we were bad before. Now we're really bad. We're bad to the bone. Now, man, we're going to conquer the world now. Because now we've got all these gods, the gods that destroyed Egypt. They're all inside this box. Woo! Yeah! So they take the box back to their, to their home church. And they served multiple gods. They were polytheists. They had many gods. But the head, the head honcho, the top god for the Philistines was a guy named Dagon. D-A-G-O. Um, Dagon. And Dagon was an interesting figure. From the waist up, he looked like a man. From the waist down, he had the body of a fish. Um, and uh, they had images of Dagon, and you can still find them in museums. You can, you can Google it and see it. And uh, they had in their main temple, they had this huge statue of Dagon, and they would come into the temple and worship. So in, uh, in uh, 1 Samuel 5, 1, the Bible says, Then the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. When the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. And when the people of Ashdod arose early in the morning, there was Dagon fallen, fallen on its face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and set it in its place again. So they bring the ark of the covenant and put it in front of, of, uh, of, the, uh, of the statue. And they go home and you know, have dinner and they go to bed and they wake up the next day. They go back to the temple. They open the doors. And to their surprise... Their God is bowed with face down before the Ark of the Covenant. Yeah! And they said, huh, we've never seen this before. This is peculiar. Maybe an earthquake. Something happened. This is, this is weird. So they picked their God up. Now, just note to self here, just a little parenthesis. If you've got to pick up your God, you've got a problem. <laughs> if your God needs your help, your God has got a problem. Your God is way too small. So they pick their God up <laughs> and put him back in his throne. And they go about their business and they worship God, their God, and they, they do their sacrifices and they do their thing. And it's end of the day, they pack up their things, they close the door, and they go home, and they have their dinners, and they watch their favorite sitcom, and they went to bed, and they come back the next morning. And they open the door wide, and guess what happened? Daggone, daggone it. <laughs> daggone is, is gone again. Daggone is on the floor again, but this time, his arms are cut off. And they said, uh-oh, this was no earthquake. This is no coincidence. That gone, it, that gone is gone. <laughs> They're in trouble. Not only that, folks, the Bible tells us that people started getting sick in town. And it was serious illness. Things were going really bad. So they decide to, well, let's move the ark around. And everywhere the ark went, the same thing happened. And people started developing tumors. And they had uh, a, a, um, uh, rats coming out of nowhere and carrying disease and destroying their crops. And, and, and you know, they're scratching their head and saying, something is wrong here. 
And they got together and they decided, well, when did, did these problems start? When did, did, the, the, when did the, 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 uh, the statue of our God start falling down? When did the diseases start started? When, when did the tumor start showing? Hemorrhoids specifically. When did the hemorrhoids start? Well, let's look at the medical records. Oh, they happened to start right around the time when the Ark of the Covenant was brought over. When did the pestilence of rats uh, started? Hmm, look at that. What a coincidence. Right around the time we brought the Ark of the Covenant. And they realized, uh-oh, we've got a problem. Verse 11, so they sent and gathered together all the lords of all the Philistines and said, Send away the Ark of the God of Israel and let it go back to its own place so that it does not kill us and our people. For there was a deadly destruction throughout all the city. The hand of God was very heavy there. And the men who did not die were stricken with tumors. And the cry of the city went up to heaven. They got together and said, let's get rid of the Ark of the Covenant. Now notice, they're not speaking about gods anymore. But they're not calling God by his name either. They yet don't know him. But they understand it's a single God. They've had time to interact with the Israelites, and they're starting, you know, maybe we should know about, more about this God. They've probably asked some questions, and they realize, okay, these are not gods. It's one God, and he's the God of Israel. They're getting closer to that revelation and that realization that God is God, that God is Jehovah, and he's the, and he's the only true God. Chapter 6, now the ark of the Lord was in the country of the Philistines seven months. And the Philistines called for the priests and the diviners, saying, What shall we do with the ark of the Lord? Tell us how we should send it to its place. So they came up with a strategy. Here's what the priests and the wise men of the Philistia said. Well, what is the problem? Well, the problems are hemorrhoids and rats. So let's do this. There are five major cities in our country. And all five of them have been plagued with, with hemorrhoids and with rats. So let's do this. this. I think this reflects a little bit of God's sense of humor and the stupidity of men. They said, okay, we got to give God something because we can't show up before him with empty hands. So let's give him something. What shall we give him? Well, if the problem is hemorrhoids and rats. Let's give him hemorrhoids and rats. So we'll make golden hemorrhoids and golden rats. Now, how do you make a golden hemorrhoid? I have no idea. Don't ask me. The Bible doesn't tell. Don't even go there. Uh, so they make five golden hemorrhoids and five golden rats. And uh, yeah, th th this will preach good, won't it? People all over the world are hearing about golden hemorrhoids. <laughs> so, what's well, in the Bible? I'm safe. So, they make these hemorrhoids and they make these rats. And they said, okay, we're going to give this to God as an offering. Aren't you glad for checks and, and cash and debit cards? I think God... Anyways, let's, let's move on. So, they said, okay, now how do we get this back to God? Well, let's put it on a cart. Again, they don't know what to do, so they're trying to figure this thing out. Let's put it on a cart, and we're going to put the, the, the gifts that we just made him with a, with a bowl. No, no, not a bowl. But we'll put them on, the, on, a, on a cart, and we'll put the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant on a cart as well. And here's how we're going to get it back there. And here's how we're going to know if God's going to accept it or not. We're going we're gonna to take calves, excuse me, we're going to take cows that have just given calves. And if you know anything about cows that have just given birth to, to little calves, they become, they're very attached. And you can't take a mama cow away from her baby cows. So here's what they said. They said, okay, we're going to take some, uh, the cows that have just given birth and we'll yoke them to this cart and we'll put all the stuff on the cart and we will keep the, the baby calves, and we will see what happens. Let's see if the cows will take the, the, the ark back, or if they will do what instinctively cows would do, which is just stay with the calves. So they set it all up, and, well, you probably know what happened. The cows take the ark of the covenant, and they take the, the freeway, and they go right into Israel. And they're all looking at that and say, wow, we don't know this God, but maybe we should. Even nature obeys him, honors him. 
Even a cow changes her ways in order to honor him. This is a God worth knowing. Verse 5, Therefore you shall make images of your tumors and images of your rats that ravage the land, and you shall give glory to the God of Israel. Perhaps he will lighten his hand from you and from your gods and from your land. This is their priest saying, Hey, you got to give this God back to their people so that he perhaps will lighten his hand for, uh, uh, um, that's, that's been against us. So that's what they did. Uh, the Bible says in verse 10, Then the man did so. They took two milk cows and hitched them to the cart and shut up their calves at home. And they set the ark of the Lord on the cart in the chest with the gold rats and the images of the tumors. Then the cows headed straight for the road to Beth Shemesh and went along the highway lowing as they went and they did not return aside to the right did not turn aside to the right hand or to the left and the lords of the Philistines went after them to the border of Beth Shemesh Beth Shemesh was right on the border of Philistia and Israel now the people of Beth Shemesh were reaping their wheat harvest in the valley and they lifted their eyes and saw the ark. And they rejoiced to see it. They were glad to see the ark is coming back. The ark is coming back. Then the cart came into the field of Joshua of Beth Shemesh. And stood there. And a large stone was there. So they split the wood of the cart. And offered the cows as a burnt offering to the Lord. The Levites took down the ark of the Lord. And the chest that was with it. In which were, in which were the articles of gold. And put them on a large stone. Then the men of Beth Shemesh offered burnt offerings and made sacrifice the same day to the Lord. So when the five lords of the Philistines had seen it, they returned to Akron the same day. So they go back home. Verse 17. These were the golden tumors which the Philistines returned as a trespass offering to the Lord. Verse 18. And the golden rats according to the numbers of all the cities. And then verse 19. Then... He struck, he meaning God, struck the men of Beth Shemesh because they had looked into the Ark of the Covenant. After all the celebration and all the offerings they gave to the Lord, they said, you know what? I've always wondered what the Ark of the Covenant looks like inside. Now God had specifically said this was a holy Ark and only a certain family could touch it when they were moving it. And even then, they were never supposed to open it. Well, the men got curious. And they said, let's peek inside. No one is, no one is looking. So they lift the mercy seat and look inside. 19. He struck the men of Beth Shemesh because they had looked into the ark of the Lord. He struck 50,000 and 70 men of the people. And the people lamented because the Lord had struck the people with a great slaughter. How many people had died in war? 44,000. More people died from peeking inside the ark than died at war. That's sad. And the men of Beth Shemesh, verse 20, said, Who is able to stand before this holy and here's the name of God, because these are people who knew better. They knew Jehovah by name. Who is able to stand before Yahweh God? And to whom shall it go up from us? So they sent messengers to the inhabitants of Kirjath Jerem, which was a town just down the highway, saying, The Philistines have brought back the ark of the Lord. Come down and take it up with you. Get rid of this box. Then the men of Kirjath Jerem came and took the ark of the Lord and brought it into the house of Abinadab of the hill, on the hill, and consecrated Eleazar his son to keep the ark of the covenant. And the ark will now stay there for 20 years. Verse 2. So it was that the ark remained in Kirjath Jerem a long time. It was there 20 years. For 20 years. Nobody even cared about moving the ark back to the place where it belonged. Namely, the tabernacle. The people were so careless about worship. They were so careless about their faith and their walk with God. That they didn't even bother to bring the box back to where it belonged. And these, this will have 
uh, ramifications that we will see in the future because it will, it will only be David much later that say, wait a minute, there's something, something wrong here. There's, there's an article missing in church. And it's David who's going to say, wait a minute, we've got to bring, bring the box back. And this is one of the reasons we will learn later that David is considered a man after God's own heart. Because he cared enough to do something about what was wrong in, in the worship of the Lord. But we'll get to that in due time. We're going to close now. Uh, but before we, uh, we, we dismiss, I just want to draw uh, three specific applications about the passage we just read. Because this is more than just history. It's funny, it's interesting, it's curious. But more than that, it is the word of God for us today. And what does this tell us in 2013? How does this apply to our lives today? Well, first of all, let's look at chapter 4 again and remember what happened. The people brought the box to, to the battlefield and they had a shouting service. And it looked so convincing that even the Philistines were afraid and concluded that God had showed up. I want to remind you of the popular saying that not everything that glitters is gold. You can have a highly charged emotional meeting. You can have people crying, screaming, jumping up and down and still have no God. Now, let me make something clear. I'm Latin. I'm emotional by nature. It's in my culture. It's in my DNA. So I'm not mocking emotions here. I'm, I'm the first one who, you know, when I sense the presence of God, sometimes I jump up and down, sometimes I cry, sometimes I lift my hands, sometimes I dance. By the way, one of the fun things about Wednesday when we go out witnessing, and this week it's going to be on Thursday. We'll go, go out this Thursday. It's in the bulletin. But anyways, one of the fun things about going out witnessing, how many chances do you get to dance out on the street? <laughs> Not many, do you? But last Wednesday, we were singing. It was getting cold, and, it was, and so we started singing and worshiping. And before you know it, I was doing this, and I, you know, I had this plaque, and I'm going like this. And it was just fun, and I looked around, and I saw other people were doing the same thing. How many times do you get a chance to dance out on the street? For the Lord. So anyways, uh, so I'm, I'm all for shouting, and, and uh, I laugh, and I cry, and I lift my hands. Emotions do not bother me. I... I, I'm, I'm a holy roller by nature. Emotions do not bother me. People running and jumping and, and shouting, it, it doesn't bother me. But I do know that shouting and screaming and, and running and, and, and crying do not necessarily mean that God is at work. You can have that, the, that outer shell without the presence of God. And I also know that sometimes God can be working in someone's life very deeply and you may not be able to tell from the outside. I know that someone can be deeply touched by the Holy Spirit and, and not be crying. So we need to be very careful about outward display because sometimes it's empty and void of meaning. And the, these people were shouting and, and excited. And boy, from the outside, they said, wow, they're having a revival. This is camp meeting. God showed up. And God was nowhere near. God was nowhere near. So be, be very careful. Be very discerning. Jesus said, by the fruits you shall know. So look for fruit. Don't, don't look for tears or shouting or, you know, who, who's carrying the biggest Bible? Who's got the suit and the tie? Those things are just outward things that often mean nothing. Mean nothing. Look for fruit. Look for fruit. Look for people who are becoming more and more like Christ. Look for the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, endurance. Look for character. Look for integrity. Look for the power of God at work in someone's life. Those things are meaningful. Jesus said, these signs will follow those who believe. So you, can, you should expect signs. When, when God's people pray, when God's people come together, there should be miracles. Sh miracles should happen. People should be healed. Demons should be cast out. People should be filled with the Holy Spirit. Suicidal tendencies should be gone. Depression should be gone. Poverty should be gone. We can expect those things. So look for fruit. Look for fruit. 
If you, if you change towns, and I hope you never do, but if you move to a different town and you have to change churches, look for a church where there's fruit. Don't look for noise. Don't look for appearances. Look for fruit. They had the box, but they didn't have God. They had the, the outward appearance, but they didn't have that God. And as a result, they were defeated. That's the message of chapter 4. The message of chapter 5 is that God will always... God refuses to be subordinated to other gods. And he will always subordinate other gods. God is God. Yahweh is God. And he will always sub subject and subordinate other gods. You can't put God under anything or anyone. Because he refuses to stay under. And so in chapter 5, the Philistines heard, uh, learned the, the hard way that uh, God is God. Only he is God, and Dagon was humiliated before him. Chapter 6 reminds us that God is real, so handle him with care. Third and final lesson for us today. God is real, so handle him with care. In chapter 6, God came back to Israel because God's presence will always fluctuate towards his people. God will always, the Bible says in the book of Psalms that he is enthroned, he inhabits, he dwells the praises of his people. The Bible tells us, well, Jesus tells us in, in John chapter 4, remember he told the Samaritan woman that you worship here and you worship there, but God is looking for people who will worship him in, in spirit and in truth. So wherever God's people get together and worship Him in spirit and truth, the Bible says that He looks for those people. He looks for that place. Jesus said where two or three are gathered in His name, He'll show up there in the middle of them. So God's presence is always fluctuating towards His people, towards the people who will meet in His name and worship Him. So He made His way. His presence made His way back to His people. But when He got there, His people weren't ready for Him. And they were careless about his presence. They were curious but careless. And they opened the ark and looked inside. And because of that, over 50,000 of them died. I want to remind you that God is real. And he must be handled with care. Let's not be flippant or careless about God. Let's not get so used to, to, the, to the presence of God that we become casual about it. Yes, you can relax and you can rest in the presence of God. And you can, in the message yesterday's powerful message, you can delight yourself in the Lord. But delight yourself in the Lord with reverence. Delight yourself in the Lord with respect because He's worth, worthy of respect. Would you stand with me as we close our service today? Alan, would you pray we're standing on holy ground and let's sing that song together just as a way of acknowledging once again that God's presence is holy and He is here. We are standing on holy ground and I know that there Sing it again.
Father, we're reminded today that your presence is holy and it's real. And your presence will subordinate other gods. Before your name, every knee must bow and every tongue must confess that you alone are Lord. So Lord, today we declare boldly, confidently we declare that you are indeed God. And that you are worthy of praise, glory, and honor. And that all other gods with small g must bow to you. And acknowledge that you alone are the true and almighty God. So today, Lord, we reinforce our commitment to you. By once again acknowledging your lordship. By once again declaring that you are real and that you're here and that you are holy. And we bow before you to crown you our King, our God, our Savior, and our Lord. And we celebrate you. And we praise you. And we worship you today. And we pledge our allegiance to you once again. We honor you with song. We honor you with testimony. We honor you with our time. We honor you with our tithe. We honor you with our talents. And we pledge, pledge our lives to you again. And in the name of Jesus, we subordinate every circumstance and every situation to the name of Jehovah. Every sickness and every disease must now bow to the name of Jesus. So we command every sickness now to leave. We rebuke it in the name of Jesus. Be healed in the name of Yahweh. Hallelujah. And we take authority over, over depression and discouragement and doubt and unbelief. It too must bow down to the name of Jesus. Demons of doubt, you must bow to the name of Jesus. Demons of death, you must bow to the name of Yahweh. We rebuke you right now. Stop. Stop and desist your attack on God's people. Jehovah abides here and He lives inside of us. And you must bow down to His name. We take authority over you right now. Every demonic work, every plot of the enemy against us, we come against it now. We rebuke it in the powerful name of Yahweh. Dagon must bow. His head chopped off. His arms chopped off, chopped off before Yahweh. And then finally, we take authority over lack and debt in poverty the God who saves is the God who heals and the God who heals is the God who prospers my God shall supply all my need according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus Yahweh is my shepherd I shall not want so in the name of Jesus we take authority over the evil gods of the world that kill, steal, and destroy, and who bring lack and poverty on people. And we pray right now that where there was po po poverty, there will now be prosperity. And where there was lack, there will now be abundance. Because God is more than enough. And my cup runs over. And God, we pray for such an abundance that we will have plenty to bless those that lack because they don't have God in their lives and Father while we're praying and rebuking the works of darkness we pray for the Philippines our hearts go out to our Filipino brethren and for the Filipino people we love the Philippines and we love Filipinos and you love the Philippines you died for Filipinos and Lord they're struggling right now we just pray for that nation. And we thank God for those who are helping. And we thank God that Convoy of Hope has been sent to the Philippines to assist. And we thank you, Lord, that we're there through Convoy of Hope and through our denomination. We're helping the Philippines. And we pray for the Red Cross and everyone else who's trying to help. And we pray for a military who's present there assisting people in need. And we just bless those efforts, Lord. And we pray for the recovery of the Philippines. And we pray that the church would shine at this moment with the love of God and bringing provision to people in need. And Lord, that what 
was meant to be a catastrophe and a disaster would be turned around to become a blessing in a way of salvation. Thank you, Lord, for entrusting us with your glory and your presence. Thank you for choosing us to carry the Ark of the Covenant on our shoulders. Thank you that wherever we go, God goes with us. For that we give you praise, glory, and honor. And may God's people shout, Amen and Amen and Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Woo, glory. God bless you. I just preach myself happy. Have a great Sunday. Meet us in about five minutes up front, and we're going to have a wonderful, glorious baptism service. It's going to take about five or ten minutes. We invite you to join us. God bless you.